So on behalf of the um, members and uh, friends of the John P. McLean family and the Department of Medicine and some distinguished guests, uh, Dr. Henry Friesen is here, um, I'd like to welcome you to the annual uh, John P. McLean Memorial Lecture. Uh, first things first, um, I have the uh, limited role today of introducing uh, the moderator to this event. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, invite Dr. Uh, Abby Angel to assume uh, his familiar role at this event uh, as moderator. Dr. Angel is known to all but the youngest of you, I guess. Um, he uh, has had a very distinguished uh, career as a clinician scientist and his work in uh, lipid and uh, lipoprotein metabolism uh, established him uh, uh, for the past many decades as uh, a, an international authority uh, in the subject. His career eventually in the early uh, 1990s led him to uh, from Toronto to uh, the Department of Medicine where he assumed the headship and uh, was responsible for the recruitment and establishment of uh, the careers of many of its current most prominent members. Um, he uh, has uh, through uh, the many uh, contributions to the Department and the Faculty of Medicine uh, earned uh, the uh, rank of uh, Professor Emeritus uh, in the Department of Medicine um, and uh, has continued to uh, serve as a leader uh, in uh, medicine nationally. Um, Dr. Uh, Angel is currently a senior resident at Massey College in Toronto where he continues to mentor and promote the careers of uh, young clinician scientists. He was a founding member of a number of national uh, academic and advocacy organizations, including the Canadian Society of Endocrinology and Metabolism and the Canadian Institute of Academic Medicine, which is the uh, predecessor organization of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. He's also established uh, the Friends of CIHR, a national organization that promotes the goals and ideals of CIHR, and under its auspices, uh, founded the Friesen International Prize in Health Research, and is now uh, currently heavily involved in the uh, Video History of Medicine in Canada project. So welcome back, Abby. And <laughs> assume your familiar role. Thank you very much, Dan, for your generous uh, introduction. I'm sorry that it's eaten into the time uh, that Dr. Feinberg will speak, but uh, I'm delighted to be back amongst you. Good morning. Uh, it's a very great pleasure for me to welcome you as well to this very special Grand Rounds program devoted to John P. McLean's memorial lecture honoring Harvey Feinberg, the 2013 Henry G. Friesen International Prize winner. I'd like to share a bit of departmental history with you because this day brings memories of a very personal significance over time. Um, 23 years ago today, in 1991, I chaired my first Grand Rounds here as a new head of internal medicine. Uh, it was a bone-chilling minus 30, not different than two weeks ago, I guess, here, and the nurses were on strike, which foretold additional jarring events. In June of 1991, Dr. John McLean died of a massive heart attack at the young age of 63. This was a tragic loss to his family, to his patients, and to our department. He was a, po a popular and sensitive clinician, a devoted teacher, and exemplary ro remo uh, role model. The Department of Internal Medicine, in recognition of his humanism, and academic contributions established this special lectureship to honor his legacy. I'd like to take this opportunity to extend special welcome to family members of John McLean and acknowledge his two sons, Ian McLean and Ken McLean, who are here with us today. Now today, uh, we honor Dr. McLean in the Hippocratic sense of, as a teacher.
our class in 1959 took the oath of hypocrisy in the original format. This was established some 2,000 years ago, but up until 1994, all physicians took this oath. In 1964, it was changed to a modern oath of hypocrisy, and you notice the difference. Uh, in the original, we all swore to reckon him who taught us this art, equally dear to me as my parents, to share my substance with him and relieve his necessities, whatever they would be, to regard his offspring as on the same footing as my own brothers and to teach them this art, and they should wish to learn it without fear stipulation, and that by precept, lecture, and every other mode of instruction, I will impart knowledge of the art to my own sons and to those of my teachers. I took that old, I'm not going to break it and adopt the new one. So the context of this is to point out the importance and relevance of our teachers today, which are forgotten, because the modern Hippocratical doesn't even mention teachers or mentors. I respect the hard-worn scientific, so it's been diluted significantly. So it's a great opportunity for me to uh, uh, reaffirm this oath. Today we honor three great teachers. Dr. McLean is a humanist. Dr. Friesen is an eminent scientist and leader. And Dr. Feinberg is a teacher of teachers. This is also an opportunity for me to acknowledge senior colleagues at the University of Manitoba who have been a staunch supporters of Friends of CIHR, which took its birth here in the Department of Medicine, and the Friesen International Prize Program. Firstly, Dr. Friesen is here, whose name this award was established. Dr. Grant Pierce, who's a member of the Board of Directors of Friends of CIHR. Dr. Freddie Oki, Dr. Arnold Neymark, and Dr. Alan Ronald, charter members of Friends of CIHR. Parenthetically, Dr. Oki, who's here today, was a member of the Executive Committee of the Department of Internal Medicine in 1991 when we uh, decided to establish the McLean Lectureship. Thank you, Fred, for the guidance. This is history and of interest to the department, and history is often forgotten, so I'm uh, delighted to uh, bring this as a reminder. Now, the second shock that I experienced in 1991 was the departure of Henry. Uh, who was appointed by the Prime Minister of the day to serve as president of MRC. And with his departure to Ottawa, Winnipeg lost a major leader for a short period of time, and I lost a colleague. But this turned out to be a blessing in disguise as his visionary leadership led to the creation of CIHR and the launch of Friends of CIHR. Now, as mentioned before, by Dan, Friends of CIHR was established in 2000 to advance the goals of CIHR. And the aims include raising the level of discourse on health issues broadly and to encourage and support young trainees in their development as future health scientists. And to achieve these goals, uh, we have three major programs, including the Henry Free G. G. Friesen International Prize which was established to, by friends to enshrine Dr. Friesen's contributions in Canadian health research and health policy development. As you know, he discovered prolactin and was instrumental in creating CIHR. Now about the Friesen Prize laureates and Dr. Feinberg. In accepting the Friesen Prize, the laureate assumes a number of responsibilities. The prize winner undertakes a public lecture in a forum in Ottawa in conjunction with the annual meetings of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences and the Canadian Society for Clinical Investigation. As well, a manuscript is submitted for publication for a wide distribution in the form of Friesen Prize lectures, and we've now published three books based on these lectures. The prize winner is also interviewed by Dr. Mr. Paul Kennedy, host of CBC Radio 1, Ideas for Free Future Broadcast. And this is available online. Finally, the prize winner undertakes institutional visits at major universities and research institutes across the country to share his or her wisdom and experience with a wider audience of students, faculty members, and policymakers, which explains Dr. Feinberg's Tuesday visit here, uh, which he has uh, served in so well. He's already had a major impact in Winnipeg health policy, if you see today's free press. Nice picture, nice commentary about taxis and health. 
Now, Dr. Feinberg is president of the Institute of Medicine in the U.S., and the Institute of Medicine uh, is the health branch of the National Academy of Sciences, an independent nonprofit organization that works to provide unbiased advice to decision makers and the public on matters of public health. Dr. Feinberg served as the provost at Harvard University uh, from 97 to 2001, following 13 years as dean of the Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Feinberg co-founded and served as the president of the Society for Medical Decision Making and is the author of several books including Clinical Decision Analysis and Innovators in Physician Education. Uh, not to forget the fact that he presided over the publication of about 700 reports of the Institute of Medicine. Dr. Feinberg earned his MD and PhD at Harvard and is the recipient of several honorary degrees and numerous awards, including the Frank A. Calderon Prize, which is the highest prize in public health, and is, he is the recipient of the 2013 Henry G. Friesen International Prize in Health Research. Today he will speak to us about quality, safety, and value in health care. Dr. Feinberg. Thanks so much, Albi. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you this morning and to have the opportunity to share with you some ideas about quality and safety and the idea of value in healthcare. I'm especially pleased to have the privilege to serve as this year's McLean Memorial Lecturer, as well as to be here under the auspices of the Friends of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research as the 2013 recipient of the Henry G. Friesen Prize. And it's a special pleasure to be here in Winnipeg uh, with Henry Friesen present, as well as members of the McLean family. Uh, and I really uh, have had such a wonderful visit uh, already over the course of the last uh, day plus. And I would just say, uh, I'll be, uh, as far as the importance of teachers, that we all cherish our teachers. For me, however, I would offer my own sense is that I always think of myself as a student. Uh, and indeed, uh, today, some of my best teachers are my students. And so the philosophy of continuity uh, in medicine over the centuries, I believe, is attributable to the fact that even as a teacher, you also are a continuing learner. And that is, I think, the source of the strength of the profession over the ages. And I'm so pleased you were uh, able to remind us about the original commendation to teachers in the Hippocratic Oath. What I want to describe today uh, are really five different aspects of the issues of quality, safety, and particularly this notion of value. Uh, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the idea of efficiency in healthcare and how it relates uh, to value. I'll illustrate uh, with a few critical examples ways that performance on these dimensions are being improved, have been improved. Uh, and then spend a little time reflecting with you on some of the basic strategies to make progress uh, on these uh, critical dimensions of quality, safety, and value. I just want to make a note uh, from the Institute of Medicine that there really are three foundational reports. All the reports uh, at the IOM are available as free PDF downloads if you're interested in any of the materials from the Institute of Medicine. Uh, many of you, and I know from my experience uh, yesterday, so actively working on quality and safety uh, here at the various hospitals in, uh, in Winnipeg uh, are very familiar with the uh, reports on errors uh, that came out in 2000 and crossing the quality chasm, our report about quality. I'll say just another word about each of those. Uh, but just a couple of years ago, uh, we produced a kind of summary report we called Best Care at Lower Cost, which really is a foundational study about the concept of value and, and uh, 
uh, raises that to, I think, the same level of, uh, of uh, guiding principles as found in the earlier reports. Now, very, very briefly, uh, in terms of quality, what the Institute of Medicine essentially did is lay out a framework and then uh, a set of activities to pursue value. And one of the most central ideas uh, from that work was that quality is really a multidimensional phenomena. And the IOM committee that produced the report said, if you're going to have high quality care, it's got to be safe, it has to be effective, it has to be centered on the needs of patients, it has to be delivered in a timely way, it has to be efficient, and it has to be equitable or fair. And all of these six dimensions are attributes that make up the notion of quality. Now, when we think about achieving quality, or why do we have problems of quality or problems of safety uh, in, in healthcare, I just want to share with you six ways of thinking about the problem, how we apprehend the problem, because each of these ways of thinking points to different kinds of solutions. For example, a first way of explaining why do we have problems of safety or quality is to say, well, we don't have the right facilities. We don't have the right equipment. We don't have the most modern or suitable technologies to care for our patients. And that's why every hospital you ever visit is constantly building something in one way or another, constantly upgrading, constantly renewing. When you go to countries which are resource-strained countries, you find fundamental gaps in the very basic elements of, of care that preclude the ability to deliver high-quality care. So uh, one way of understanding the problem is that we just don't have the right stuff to put in place and apply to the needs of our patients. A second way of apprehending the problem is basically a deficiency in the values, in the way in which clinicians, especially doctors, nurses, and other clinicians approach their patients. They're not thinking constantly and critically only and exclusively about the patient. They're distracted by other things. They are, if you will, not sufficiently motivated or understanding about the responsibilities of the clinician to the needs of the individual patient. And that expresses itself in everything from the way people are respected or not in the course of care to priorities of institutions about making it convenient for the doctors or nurses or making it more convenient for the patients. Who parks where in the parking lot? Very simple question. Who, who comes first? So this is a, understanding the problems of safety and quality as a deficiency of attention to the needs of uh, patients. And if you said, well, what's the solution here? It would be, well, select students and reinforce in students, inculcate in students the Hippocratic values about putting patients first. A third way of apprehending the problem of quality and safety is really uh, a way of thinking about people making choices that are in their own interest. We all do uh, all the time. If you want doctors to uh, care for patients in ways that, uh, that protect uh, the safety of patients and enhance the quality of care, well, you should reward them for uh, providing uh, high-quality uh, care, and you should uh, make them uh, not rewarded when the safety is at risk, and that would say, well, maybe these malpractice problems are actually not uh, as serious problems as you might think, but the problem is the way we're applying them, and we ought to still have sanctions as well as rewards to make it rational for people to make the easy choice. Uh, a fourth idea is that it's really a psychological problem. It's a problem of uh, choice and uh, preference that any normal human being would uh, would uh, uh, favor so that uh, when you are uh, fatigued, when you're under stress, when you haven't had enough sleep, when there's an emergency, when there is a crisis, or when there is not and you lose your sense of attentiveness because you're exhausted, well, that's uh, a problem of uh, the not recognizing the psychology of getting enough rest, having work hours that are more humane, having a balance in uh, the work life for doctors and nurses and others. And so here the solution would be uh, make the psychology available or 
reach to the psychological needs of people to make them able to deliver higher quality and safer care. Fifth way of understanding the problem is to say, well, it's basically a challenge of education. Uh, if you want people to know how to deliver safe and high quality care, you've got to teach them. You have to demonstrate the ways in which care can be delivered that really meets the needs of patients and that you uh, give people the opportunity as growing health professionals to learn what it takes to deliver safe and high quality care. And finally, uh, you could understand the problem of, uh, of uh, poor quality and unsafe care as a problem of the systems of care. And the systems of care mean the people, the equipment, the technology, the environment, all in the way they interact. And the Institute of Medicine committees that have looked at safety and quality essentially uh, implicitly have acknowledged all these different elements. And they all have some relevance, I would submit, and they all have some bearing on improving quality and safety. But the big emphasis that the IOM brought forward on the problem is to apprehend it as a systems problem, as a problem not of the blame of the individual, but of the way all parts of the system interact to produce a result. If you want a system that on average produces two patients who die on the way home from hospital, design the system so that two patients on average out of a year will die on the way home from a hospital. If you want a system that is going to have no inappropriate surgery errors of wrong limb surgery, design the system so that you do not have any wrong limb surgery. The idea behind this is not to make a system that it is possible to practice safe care, but to design a system where it's virtually impossible to practice unsafe care. And that mindset, that philosophy, that approach uh, is a lot of what's behind the thinking at, uh, at the IOM. Now these uh, ideas of, uh, of uh, structure and moral values and rational choice and psychology uh, and education as well as systems. You could think of them as the approaches of the uh, building contractor, the philosopher, the economist, the psychologist, the teacher, and the engineer. And in fact, all of them, I would say, uh, have a bearing, but especially we have an opportunity to do more when looking at the problem and understanding the problem as a systems problem. Now, is design of the system important? This is one of my favorite illustrations. This is a, a, a portrayal by Jacques Carlman, which he calls coffee pot for masochists. And the point of this is that even everyday utensils are designed either to be functional and safe or non-functional and relatively uh, unsafe. So in thinking about health care, as we'll come back in design, uh, we have to design it so that it's safe, the handle and the spout in the right places. Now, I want to spend a few minutes talking about this uh, added concept of value, because the idea of value in healthcare, especially in an environment in which we are concerned about the cost of care, as well as the quality and safety of care, is a very important concept and I think uh, bears uh, a fair amount of attention. It's closely related to what economists call efficiency, but they use the word efficiency in a number of different ways that I want to kind of parse for us so we know what we're really talking about. Uh, basically, you can think about efficiency in terms of technical efficiency, production efficiency, or allocative efficiency, and I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, on each of these. Technical efficiency means when there's no greater output that you can achieve for a given level of resource input, then you've achieved what's called technical efficiency. You've produced at what would be a production possibility frontier. Now, this can be shown graphically where you have two inputs. Think of these as uh, nursing hours and, uh, and uh, hospital beds as two inputs to produce uh, uh, care for a patient. 
and the more you put in of nursing hours in a given number of beds, you can improve care. The more beds a given number of nurses have to work with, they can improve care up to a point. But you reach a point where you've done as much as you can do by combining nurses and beds, you reach the so-called production possibility frontier. So for a given number of, uh, of nurses, only so many beds can help and vice versa. The question is, where should you operate on that combination of possibilities? And that's where you get to production efficiency, which is when you combine resources like labor or equipment and supplies to achieve a given input, and it's called efficient when it's achieved at the lowest resource cost. So let's go back to our little figure. If nursing hours are relatively cheap and beds are relatively expensive and nurses are input A and beds are input B, if you have a cheap input, what would you want to use? More of it or less of it? More. It's cheap. If you have an expensive input, what would you want to use? Less. So if A is cheap and B is expensive, you'll want to practice on this frontier really near the very uh, upper left where you've got a lot of A and a relatively little of B. Whereas if B were cheap and A were expensive, it would be the opposite. You'd want to practice down uh, at the frontier at the lower right. Are you all with me? Good. OK, so basically you could say where you practice, where you want to operate efficiently on this production possibility frontier depends on the ratio of the input costs. But now let's come to the heart of the matter for health. What is it to say we have efficient use of resources for health? This gets to the economic concept of allocative efficiency. And allocative efficiency means that you deploy your resources so as to optimize the benefit. And what does the benefit mean? Well, economists often think about markets. And the benefit is what people want. So market efficiency, uh, in effect, means that you allocate resources according to the willingness of people to pay for whatever it is that they are buying. And a market is efficient, uh, especially when it's competitive. And at a competitive market, the economists say, well, the marginal amount someone is willing to pay is exactly equal to the marginal amount that someone is willing to sell. And so you've got marginal cost and marginal price equal. And that's where the markets, whatever it's for, whether it's for trinkets or for lives, those markets are then operating efficiency, uh, efficiently. But what does it mean to have health efficiency in a population? I would submit that it means that we distribute our health resources in such a way that we have optimized or maximized the level of health in the population. So if we want to make health the goal, and we want to use our resources to achieve the greatest amount of health for a population, can we do that just by having people decide to buy and sell services for health? There's a lot of assumptions that go into that kind of a model. You would have uh, information that people have available. They would know what they're getting and what they're costing. One of the big problems in the United States is that people never know what it is they're actually paying for anything or what someone is paying for anything. The pricing is never revealed. Uh, you'd have no barriers to different uh, uh, sources or uh, providers because you'd be able to go to different places where the service could be made available to you. And that's a very interesting phenomenon now that's happening actually globally in the movement of patients uh, to different uh, places. You would have your preferences for what you're trying to achieve individually as a patient uh, expressed and coincide with exactly uh, what's available in terms of health. And uh, a very critical equity assumption, of course, is that if you want to achieve health equitably, you'd have to have purchasing power uh, equitably. And that's one reason why universal insurance and social support helps move ironically toward a more perfectly functioning marketplace because in effect it equilibrates the health purchasing power of the population across all people. So if we want to get serious about efficiency, we have a lot of things we would need uh, to measure. We'd want to know what is the input cost we're actually providing to deliver a service. We'd want to know how much it costs by price to get each of those inputs. We'd have to measure what it is we're getting out in terms of health 
benefits, and we'd have to know how important are those benefits, how much does it matter whether we are extending life or improving the quality of life to different people. And those are very all hard uh, questions. Now, when we look practically at health, we focus for efficiency on key elements of production, uh, units of service, episodes of health, management of a condition over a period of time, the health of an individual over a sustained period, or the health of a community. But each of these kinds of things we look at uh, differentiate the kind of measures and the in incentives that are applied. If we're looking, for example, to optimize the health of the person, that's very different from looking to optimize the value of back surgery for people. And so these are related, but they're not at all the same thing. When I use the word efficiency, though, I want to make clear I'm not just talking about making things cheaper by cutting costs. That's not what value is about. It's about health benefit for what we expend. It's not just about uh, as some people think about efficiency is how much revenue does that produce for the practice. That's not what I'm talking about. That's a different, uh, a different notion. It's not about making the doctor's life easier rather than the patient's lives easier. I had a friend who was the uh, chief medical officer at a major teaching hospital, and he noticed that all of the orthopedists routinely ordered MRIs on every patient before they saw the patient. And when he asked the group, why do you order the test before you see the patient, their answer was, it's more efficient. So they meant efficient for them. They didn't mean efficient in the sense that uh, we're talking about. And efficiency is the way I'm talking about it. It's not about a just system. It's not about the uh, distribution of service in a just way. That's a separate need, and that has to be looked at uh, and attended to along with efficiency, but it's not the same as efficiency. So uh, efficiency, when we think of it in, in a way of meaning eliminate waste in the system, it's one of those dimensions of quality, that it, uh, it's, it's efficient. But quality, if we think of quality as the benefit of health in a care system, that's actually a big part of the equation for efficiency. And this is where the idea of value really comes in. Value simply understood is a ratio of the amount of health benefit that we're getting for the amount of resource costs that we're putting in. And so if you don't care about cost and you're unconstrained in resources, then you don't have to worry about value. You can just try to maximize health. But if you live in the world and you do have to worry about resource costs collectively, that we have to worry about it. Then we need to be thinking about what we're actually getting for what we're able to expend. Now let's look at some overall figures. This is an interesting figure, a selected group of OECD countries, and it's about life expectancy, which is the base measure of quality and performance and outcomes in healthcare over a 50-year uh, period, and it's all pretty impressive. The, uh, yellow, which is a little hard to see, but that is Canada, and it's a, uh, it didn't have exactly the same year, but it's the same basic idea. Canada was going along with uh, most everyone else pretty well. You'll notice that the United States uh, has a somewhat, it's the red line, has a somewhat lower rate of improvement than many of the other countries, including Canada. Now this is a rather interesting figure on health expenditures as a percent of GDP over the same period. And again, it's a little hard to see, but a little known fact is in 1960, Canadians spent a higher fraction of your GDP on health than did the United States of America. Today, that's rather astonishing to believe. But if you go back 50 years, Canada was right up there. Over the ensuing period, Canada has increased quite a lot. That's the top of the lower group. But nobody, nobody has come close to the United States in the rate at which expenditures have improved. Now, before we get too carried away, this is a figure from the Commonwealth Fund which looks at uh, seven different countries, OECD countries. Without going into the detail, all of the quality access efficiency rating elements, darker blue is better and very pale is worse. And you'll notice that the two countries with the most pale results are 
Canada, and the United States. So if you only look south, you look great. But if you look east or west, uh, then Canada also has some ways to uh, improve. Now in the US, uh, we've got a horribly uh, difficult problem with our national debt uh, and with our budget. Uh, and we know that the biggest driver of this in terms of those things which we have to get a hold of uh, is uh, our health care expenditures over time. Uh, we can't solve the U.S. debt problem without solving the health problem for the government. We can't solve the health problem for the government if we don't solve the health problem for everyone. And we can't solve the health problem for everyone in a morally justified way if we don't focus on value and increasing the performance of the system as well as look at ways to save resources. So uh, what is the evidence that we have opportunity to do that? It's abundant. In the US, at least, here's a figure that shows uh, for Medicare patients, these are our elderly patients in our system, these are the per capita expenditures, and these are measured against a ranking in quality by state. And the message here is that spending more per capita is not associated with doing better. It's in fact the opposite. When you spend more in the US, you're mostly wasting the money. You're not applying it to, on average, improving the outcome. When the Institute of Medicine looked at this question uh, particularly, uh, we conservatively estimated that there were every year hundreds of billions of dollars available in the US health system that are being expended today for purposes that do not contribute materially to the health benefit of people. And that is an enormous opportunity uh, for, uh, for savings. One of the biggest in the US is administrative uh, inefficiency, administrative waste because of our multiplicity of billing and claims forms, which is a, which is a multi, multi-billion dollar problem uh, and opportunity in the US. So what are some of the drivers of inefficiency? First, we often pay for the wrong things. We pay for, uh, we pay for doing more services than we pay for achieving better results. So making adjustments of quality and performance according to compensation is uh, a big uh, issue. Why do we pay hospitals when they readmit patients within 30 days? Think about that. Uh, imagine you, you bought your washing machine and you paid them the second time when they took it back to, to repair it within 30 days. How, does that make good sense? Not really. Uh, what about uh, patients? Uh, we have uh, a question about what is the appropriate way to incentivize or not patients to make wise choices in their own care. This is a very difficult and challenging uh, problem, but everyone makes choices according to cost as well. And if a good is very, very free or cheap, then uh, you are going to be uh, using much more of it. Uh, what about the fact that uh, those orthopedists that I mentioned had no stake in the fact that using the MRIs uh, would cost somebody more money. If there were a global payment for all services that the group had to work out, I expect they would soon come to see that maybe not all of those MRIs are quite as efficient as they uh, initially were thinking. Uh, we have a very serious concern in the US. I don't know the state of the discussions altogether in Canada about end of life care. We have a huge amount of resources that are expended, but most importantly, we give patients and families often the kind of care they do not want toward the end of life in complicated illness. They, don't, they want to be free of pain, they want to be with their loved ones, and they want to be kept comfortable. And instead, we put them in places with tubes and noise and isolation. And so uh, this is a very serious problem. It's a political as well as a hu humanitarian problem. Uh, and it's a very serious issue in the US. It happens to be one that we are also in the midst of study. Uh, and I hope we'll have some 
uh, good uh, suggestions coming forward from the IOM this spring. Uh, we, in almost every country, do not do enough to prevent disease in the first place. Uh, and we don't do enough to attend to the disparities in care, to the populations that are disadvantaged by geography, by ethnicity, by poverty, and in other ways. We sometimes uh, have two complicated administrative and delivery systems that are not sufficiently coordinated. I was very pleased actually yesterday to hear about the uh, growing roles of the regional authorities in uh, Manitoba and in other provinces and the hope that that can help improve the kind of coordination and allocation of resources that makes better sense. We certainly do not give people information about price and what, what anything is costing uh, anyone. Uh, and I would uh, dare say if you ever have a relative in the U.S. who's been hospitalized as a Medicare patient, asked to see their bill, I defy you to decipher it. Uh, we have a, a problem of what's called dysfunctional competition. It's competition for the wrong things, the things that add cost instead of producing more uh, value. A wonderful book by uh, Michael Porter and Elizabeth Teisberg on the value proposition in healthcare, I think, is something that I would uh, highly recommend. And then we do have distortions introduced by conflict of interest, by fraud. It turns out in the United States in uh, Medicare that one state to another, there can be a two plus fold difference between the cost of care for the same type of patient. And what accounts for the two and a half times difference? It turns out that 70% of that in the US is attributable to what's called post-acute care, how you care for patients immediately after hospitalization, what happens to them. And in the very costly states, there are a large number of uh, facilities, rehabilitative facilities that are sometimes co-owned by physician groups and others and uh, which are utilized uh, uh, very extensively in the care of patients post-acute care. Uh, so again, it's a, it's a way of looking at the distortions that come in from, uh, from interest. Now I just want to cite a couple of examples of ways that we can uh, improve on, on this performance and, and things that we can accomplish by uh, working more effectively uh, to overcome these problems of lack of value in care. We, we need to look at the whole of the problem. We need to look both at the benefits and the cost side. We, uh, in the U.S. at least, need desperately to accelerate the pace of change. And that means we've got to be willing to do a lot of things at the same time. I'm just going to illustrate very briefly with three cases uh, what kinds of things can be done. I want to show you some data from an analysis of the ways in which uh, a group of physicians uh, were uh, using drugs to care for patients with hypertension. Now, hypertension is a very, very common problem, and you'd think it's not a really very expensive problem, but when you add up the amount that's spent on every patient that has hypertension, it adds up to a fair amount of money. And what this analysis did is it looked at the group of doctors, this was several hundred doctors, and it divided them by quintiles into the higher cost and lower cost caregivers. And this uh, shows uh, the cheapest group of doctors, the distribution of their costs by lab, office visit, and pharmacy, all the way up to the most uh, expensive. Now, here's a group mostly of clinicians. How many of you are clinicians here? You almost all see patients with hypertension. So let me ask you a question. A 48-year-old woman comes in. She's got uh, a blood pressure of 150 over 110. You start her on medication. You have her come back in 10 days. She's seen by the nurse, and her blood pressure now, after 10 days, is 130 over 90. When does she come back for the next visit? That's the question. How many people would bring her back in a month to recheck? Two months. Three months. Four months. Five months. Well, I have to give you credit for uniformity. I don't know if three months is the right answer, but everyone here thinks three months is what they would do. Maybe there's a guideline. <laughs> uh, the point is that there are many, many things we do in practice where we don't really know 
what the optimum is. We don't know if it would matter if it was three or four months, really, or two for this patient, or how we get up to that. Uh, we haven't looked at that data. And if you think about it, well, what's the difference between three and four months? To you, it's not much. To the patient, it's not much trouble. But add it up over all patients, over the whole system, the difference between two and four is the difference between five or six visits in a year or three visits in a year, which is twice as many visits multiplied by the number of hypertensive patients. You got a lot of visits. But look at these data on the difference between the relative. This is about the net cost differences per episode of care. And if I ask you, okay, the left uh, kind of turquoise is lab tests, the middle, the sort of more ruby is office visits, and on the right, the, the whitish is pharmacy, what is it that's responsible for the difference in the cost of care? Well, pharmacy. I mean, the, the lower cost docs are prescribing something that's a lot cheaper than the others. So let's look into pharmacy a little bit more and here's what you find, basically, without going uh, into it uh, too much, is that those who manage their patients most efficiently rely on the thiazides and the ACE inhibitors, and those who uh, manage their patients most expensively tend to rely on combination drugs and, uh, and uh, angiotensin receptor blockers. Okay, so what does this say? Do, do we know which of these works better? Well, actually, there is a trial. A uh, pretty good trial, and it turns out uh, they all work pretty well. And there are patients, of course, that can't uh, tolerate the thiazides as well. But this is an illustration of a way that standards of care uh, can make a huge difference overall in, in cost. Now let me look at a, at a group of, uh, of patients and a whole field and what happened in terms of safety and quality over time. And here the example is anesthesia. Uh, when uh, Abby and... Uh, and Henry were going through their training uh, and uh, thinking about sending a patient to surgery, uh, the mortality from anesthesia, from general anesthesia, was probably about 1 in 10,000. Uh, in fact, uh, that persisted uh, up through the early 1980s, just from the anesthesia. Now, today, it's gone by more than an order of magnitude improved. It's now about one in 200,000. In the US, it's uh, resulted in dramatic reductions in claims and judgments and fees that anesthesiologists have to pay for malpractice. But how did it happen? It did not happen by accident. It happened by a whole series of improvements that were engineered and applied by concerted attention across the field. An Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation, which began in the mid-1980s, publicized all of the problems and analyzed them in the same way that our transportation board analyzes uh, mishaps in airplanes. They, of course, were advantaged by some new technology. I mean, if you have measurement uh, very easily of oxygenation and carbon dioxide production, you are pretty sure you haven't put the endotracheal tube uh, in the esophagus. So uh, you also had a lot of machines uh, that were redesigned and training of people that was more standardized so that things were routinized in a way that reduced errors that were avoidable. You also had the development of very sensible connectors so it became impossible to connect an oxygen hose to something that wasn't oxygen. Now, uh, all of those changes were very, very important and transformed the field. Let me give you an institutional example. St. John's Hospital is a uh, major ho teaching hospital in Springfield, Missouri, 32 operating rooms, 29,000 procedures uh, almost a decade ago, and uh, many, many emergency room visits, uh, about a fifth of whom were admitted. Now, the problem that they had was a lack of flexibility in scheduling elective surgery and midweek peaks in surgery that resulted from, uh, and also backups in, in admissions that often made it impossible for patients to be cared for at the proper floor. Uh, every emergency room that you want to visit is always crowded. Are your, is your emergency room crowded? I bet you a nickel it's crowded. Uh, I know I can't bet a penny anymore, but I'd be willing to bet up to a nickel. 
Uh, okay, uh, it's, it's crowded. Every emergency room is crowded. Why is it crowded? It, if you had a bucket, say you had a bucket and it's collecting water, and you have a little tiny uh, outflow, and the bucket fills up with rainwater, and it starts to overflow. And you say, well, why, what am I going to do about it? And your first answer is, I'm going to get a bigger bucket. And so what you'll hear is that we need a bigger emergency room because we can't accommodate all the patients. So what's going to happen if you get a bigger bucket and it keeps raining? The answer is that's going to fill up eventually and it's going to overflow. And the problem isn't the bucket size, the problem is the outflow size. The problem is the spigot that lets the water out. And so what you find again and again when you look at hospital flow of patients is that although you might think that a lot of variability is caused by emergencies, it turns out that most of the variation is actually caused by scheduled admissions variation because the surgeons really don't like to operate on Friday. And you also have dedicated operating rooms. And so what St. John's did is it said, well, we'll take these problems seriously. We'll look at our flow. We'll look at setting aside a room. And basically, after they smoothed the elective surgery, they found that their capacity for emergency admissions rose by nearly twofold. And they had a 59% increase in inpatient capacity without adding an additional bed. They also had that the reduction in the number of OR rooms over, that were needed in overtime. And at, although there was a lot of resistance at first in the idea of making these changes among the surgeons, they were absolutely thrilled that they had increase in surgical volume and therefore greater throughput of patients over time. And overall, this whole idea, which I know is a big concept now in, uh, in the province on flow, is a really promising way to improve performance, increase value, and not have to really uh, take any hit in quality in order to do it. Now, I'm going to jump over these uh, strategies because of our time and just want to say that all of the strategies about increasing value, which look both at benefits and costs, tend to focus on four key ideas. Flow of information, application of incentives, innovation that matters, and integration across different aspects of, uh, of the system. But the final thought I want to leave you with is that for all of this to work, we also have to face up to attributes of the culture of medicine in which we practice. Attributes of the culture which go back in history to the Hippocratic concepts that Abhi uh, introduced, but which are just as relevant today. And it's the notion of what does it mean to be a professional in healthcare. I would submit it means adhering to the values of quality and safety, to be sure, but it means also attention to the sensible application of resources. It means attending to value as well as quality and safety. John Kenneth Galbraith, who was the economist at Harvard, once observed that humility is a vastly overrated virtue. Now, of course, he was at Harvard, so he would think you know, humility was a vastly overrated virtue. But uh, I would submit that autonomy is a vastly overrated principle. And I think that our notion of autonomy is really intended to be more of a sense of responsibility to individual patients and at large. And I think we need to move from the idea of doing things that are good for the institutions of care to doing things that are good for people and the people who are in our care. And we need to move from the idea that we're going to avoid errors to the notion that we have a culture of safety that makes it almost impossible to commit an error that harms a patient. And finally, that we move from the idea that I'm only responsible for the individual patient in front of me to the fact that we share a collective responsibility for all of our patients. And in that way, can work together to enhance the safety, the quality, and the value of health care. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, uh, Harvey. Pleasure. That was just wonderful. Pleasure. Because of the hour, uh, I think we need to conclude. And I'd like to invite uh, Brian Postel to the podium to say a few words of appreciation. And Thank you, Dr. Feinberg. That was really a, uh, a wonderful discussion. When I uh, was much younger, they used to say, you can have it uh, cheap, you can have it fast. 
and you can have it good, you can only manage two of those. But I think uh, you've really demonstrated that the connection between safety, quality, and efficiency or value, uh, or the grail that we all seek, is both achievable and, uh, and necessary to move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Give us Thank all. You. Oh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. Well, um, in conclusion, it's uh, my uh, honor in a way to thank Dr. Feinberg, uh, but also to express great appreciation to the Faculty of Medicine, Brian Postel, Dan Roberts, for their support of this event and for uh, um, the endorsements to Friends of CIHR and the Friesen Prize, which uh, continue. Now, Dr. Feinberg has undertaken a larger responsibility on behalf of these organizations. This represents his uh, first major Western institutional visit. He then goes on to Calgary uh, and Edmonton in, in March during those fine months uh, to continue to share knowledge and experience for all of us. So thank you, Harvey, for all that you've done uh, honoring the uh, uh, the McLean uh, Lectureship and uh, all of us at the University of Manitoba. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.